so uh, good afternoon everyone uh, greenworks trust welcomes you to this online session greenworks trust is a mumbai based organization working for nature conservation and we strongly believe that education and awareness are very important so during this lockdown time we bring to you these informative sessions about various topics our today's topic is into the world of bees and that is on the world bee day so and we have dr uh, uh, preeti virkar to talk on it Uh, Dr. Preeti Virkar has completed her MSc in Environmental Science from Pune, uh, and after her MSc, she worked on tigers and gores. Uh, she later pursued her interest in bees to complete a PhD from Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun, and then she worked as a postdoc at Northeastern University, Shillong, and now she works with an NGO called Navadnya. So now I hand over the session to Dr. Preeti Virkar. Hi, ma'am. Who is it? thank you green team yeah green works team uh, trust so a very good afternoon late afternoon to all of you so and welcome into the world of bees so today we are going to um, get a glimpse into what bees exactly are because whenever we talk about bees the first thing or the first picture which comes to our mind always is the honey bees with those hundreds and thousands of workers on inside those boxes and they store a lot of honey which is of utmost interest to us for economic and nutritional uh, purposes so let's begin without wasting much time and let's look at what are these different bees that we have around the world and uh, what composition or what part of particular groups uh, are there in the different parts of the globe so the first thing to understand here is that uh, bees have evolved from uh, wasp like ancestors right so most wasp and wasp like ancestors were predatory in nature they were carnivorous or you can call them non vegetarian in uh, quite common language and they would usually hunt and uh, other insects or maybe smaller sizes of um, Uh, living organisms and when the bees evolved 1. Uh, sorry 140 million years ago they uh, were different from their ancestors in the form that they would they were fly loving and that's how the name of bees called as anthophila came so anthos means flower and phila is the love so love for flowers that is they feed on these flowers now through evolution obviously over all these years what happened is that bees evolved into these different families or groups we can say uh, out of which large number of them are found all across the globe except in uh, antarctica then there are some groups which are found only in australia there are some groups which are widespread except in australia then there are certain groups which are present everywhere in the world but absent in south america and australia right maybe this happened when the continental drift was happening and then you know certain places were devoid of the, the bees certain places had particular plants and that's how bees came so all these things we go through our uh, presentation through the session we will see what are these different groups so you can see here there are seven different families of bees uh, you have the colitidae in yellow halictidae megachelidae and the apidae all in yellow so these are widespread across the globe then you have the stenotritidy which is found only and only on uh, uh, australia in australia then we have the group andronidy which is a widespread group except in australia it's found everywhere in the world however this particular group has very few species of bees in every region you can see it's just 15% of all the bees that we have around the world then we have the uh, then we have the melitidy group Uh, which is absent from south america and australia and a lot of times biologists also do not consider this as a separate family but some biologists do some biologists do not uh, consider it as, as a different group now you'll be surprised to see that we have a family here that is second from bottom apd which is 29% of the bee population that's the largest number of bees are found in this particular family you'll be uh, you might not know so let me point it out here all our honey bees come from this particular group we'll deal with them a little later right 
uh, and the total number of honeybee uh, honeybees that we know are just five but other than honeybees there are some bees who do not produce honey in large amounts but then they carry out a very important function which we'll come to uh, soon in this session so all these large number of bees they come under the uh, they uh, complete a total population of 19000 plus different um, 19000 plus number of species around the world some estimates are that there may be more than 20000 different bees around the world out of this hardly 0.1 or 0.2% or maybe 1% of the bees form the honey bees whom we know very well so let's go ahead and see what these bees exactly uh, look like right so what is a bee body uh, what does a bee body consist of like any other insect the bee body consists of the abdominal part the thorax thorax part and the head part right and here you can see we have marked in red and we've written in white and some places we've written in black you can see that the head consists of branched hair uh, sorry the entire body consists of branched hair uh, and bunches of them are found at different areas you can see it on the thorax you can see it on the head you can see it on the legs of the bee these bunches of hair are called as scopa in case of bees right and you can see that they have uh, these segmented antenna we'll have a closer look a little later then you, they have compound eyes where you have tiny facets of eyes put together so that the bees can um, understand different colors time of the day to navigate right then you have the mandibles in common terms you can call these mandibles as jaws of the bees and in different species of bees the mandibles are modified into uh, sharp blade like structures or very strong chisel like structures to carry out different behaviors as per their requirements then you have the tongue of the bee which you can see here this tongue helps the bees in sucking the nectar from the flower then you have the three pairs of legs here i have just uh, pointed out the hind leg and on the hind leg also you have a lot of bee structures called as the pollen basket and that is tufts of uh, hair that is scopa on which pollen is attached right then you have two pairs of wings the hind and the fore wing and these wings also depending on uh, these wings are attached at a place called as the tegula depending on the distance between the two tegula which is there on the thorax of the bee we can decide how far the bee goes to forage right now that we understand the bee body let's go ahead and look at how to identify bees from other insects now a lot of us get confused here if you look at this picture here on the right top we have a bee like insect um, sitting on a yellow flower and right bottom we have a bee like insect sitting on a jasmine wild jasmine flower then we have left bottom a big fat bee like insect sitting on the white flower and on left top we have bee like insect sitting on the some wild flower from the forest you can see that on top left it's a fly top left uh, not uh, not top left right uh, right top sorry yeah this one here right top where i'm moving my cursor is a fly it's called as a surfeit fly right then the one below is also a surfeit fly the one on left bottom is a drone fly now all these three flies they mimic bees because they can keep predators away saying that i have a very painful string so just keep away so these are like uh, they are just mimicking the bee but they are not bees how will you differentiate them from a bee in case of a bee the compound eyes like you see here the compound eyes are wide apart and there's a space on their head between the two eyes but in case of flies you can see there's a fusion you cannot see any space on the head it's just two eyes fused together in all these pictures then this one here is a wasp which is closely related to the bee but it's not a bee 
and a, be, uh, a wasp can be identified from the very thin waist or abdomen that it has that attaches to its thorax, right? Now, let's move ahead and look at the sizes of bees. Now, you'd be surprised to know that bees come in different sizes. There are those which are as tiny as a few millimeters to those that are as big as two, two and a half centimeters sometimes, right? Here you have on the left side picture, you can see on the tip of a finger is a tiny sweat bee. And you can see here on the left side picture, there's a, a bee. It's a carpenter bee. It has a yellow back. It's uh, sucking nectar from mustard flower here. And this bee is easily from one and a half to two centimeters in length. And it's really stout and a little bit fuzzy. It has a nice metallic shine on its body, right? So these are the huge variations in sizes that you can find. Now, depending on how big these bees are, like this, if you can see my cursor, this is the tegula where the wing is joined. So there is another tegula on the other side, which you can't see here, right? So usually if you measure the distance between these two tegula, the larger the distance, the further they go to find their food. So they maybe they'll go two to three kilometers or more than that, right? In case of this tiny bee here sitting on the fingertip, the intertegular distance, which means the distance between the two tegula where the wings join is small and it will have very small ranges, maybe just um, 10 meters or five meters or one meter at the most, because they're really tiny bees, which and the muscles which help them in flight are very small and that's why their distance of traveling for food will be smaller. Now we look at what are the different types of bees have, we have with respect to colors. Usually when we talk of honeybees, all we understand or if you ask even someone to draw a honeybee cartoon, they'll usually make a bee with a yellow and black band abdomen and a stinger coming out from the end of the abdomen. But then if you look into the world of bees, you'll see that there are a huge number of bees there with wide, uh, large number of colors that you can find. Here you can see this bee here, Xylocopa, and you can just pay attention to the cursor every time I say, look at this bee. So you can see it has a yellow back. It has a nice shiny metallic black abdomen. Then you have a bee here whose color you cannot figure out very well, but it looks brown because it's got brown color hair. Then you have a blue banded bee. Here you have a bombus, that is a bumblebee. This one is from Dehradun, Dune Valley. You can see it's got orange and yellow and black and white patches all over. Then you can see a tiny carpenter bee with a green, metallic green or peacock blue, peacock green body. Uh, then you have one bee here which has a patch on its face. We'll look at these bees more clearly in the coming slides. Then you have a rock bee here, which has yellow and um, black stripes on its abdomen. This one is one of the honeybees that we're going to look at today. Then you have some other bees, like this one is also a tiny, uh, uh, tiny carpenter bee. It has some marks on its uh, clypeus. Then this one here is the Asian hive bee, or you call it Desi Madhumakhi. It's the native bee to Indian subcontinent. Then you have the Apis floria or the dwarf bee. Can you see the coloration difference? This is also a honeybee. Then you have Apis mellifera. These are, you can see the queen here and you can see a lot of tiny uh, workers around her. Then you have the stingless bee. It has nice, uh, the top part of the bee is black, but then the abdomen is, uh, it's like honey colored. Then you have an anthophorid bee. It has a lot of fuzzy hair, which is mostly rufous, or, uh, not rufous, but brown in color, buff colored, right? So what different body structures can tell us about bee? Now we've looked at the colors and you've also seen that these bees had different structures. Some of them had very big and fat heads. Some of them had fluffy abdomens. Some of them had these bands and colors and all. So how all of this, and the other body structures on bees are used to, and what information they have to tell us about a bee. So let us have a look at that. Here, if you look at 
the the first slide here where, which says branched hairs and there's a red arrow showing the hair can you see the branching on these uh, hairs now yeah. this is one character that scientists biologists use to actually identify these bees uh, from the other insects so presence of branched hairs confirmed it's a bee but if you do not have the facility of using microscopes and all you can always make out from the fuzziness of the insect that it's a bee right then you have the sting this is the end of the abdomen and you have the sting then you have antennal segments so usually an antenna looks like a thread but if you look closely it has a lot of tiny segments and in case of males and females in the bees these tiny segments the number of them, uh, these segments they vary in case of males there are 13 segments you can see from 1 to 13 marked here in case of females it's 12 segments now the main function of these antenna are to uh, these are chemoreceptors so the bee can actually sense the kind of chemicals or the kind of compounds which will be present in the nectar right that's how they locate the same flowers every time they want to uh, take some nutrition hello yes yes the session is going perfect yeah 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 can you see the slide because my computer just went off yeah okay fine 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 we'll start here right this is where we were so they have uh, can you hear me yes hello yes yeah so uh, we have Yes, so we have these antennal segments. Uh, in males, you have more antennal segments, and in females, you have less. Then you have the turga. Now, turgas are structures or segments, the abdominal segments on the dorsal side or on the top side of the bee, right? So those are known as turga. In case of um, males and females, again, these number of turga, they differ. In case of males, you can see six segments. You can see this is a male bee here. In case of uh, Female bees, you can see five segments, right? Then here you can see uh, the next structure under the label scopa. You can see the lower part of the abdomen exposed. Also, you can see the legs, the first and the second, uh, the the middle and the uh, last pair of uh, last set of legs here, right? Do you see these tufts or these bunches of hair on the underside of the abdomen? Now these are called as scopa and they play a huge role in collection of pollen from the flowers. And in some bees, instead of the lower part of the stomach, their legs act as these pollen storing places called as pollen baskets. Then there are other appendages on the feet, which, uh, on the leg, which are used to comb that pollen, called as the pollen comb, right? Let's go ahead and look at some more structures now besides being divided into all those different groups we, which we saw in the beginning with all that tree chart and all there are other ways of dividing or segregating the bees also into um, long tongue and short tongue bees right and long tongue and short tongue is not because the length of the tongue is long or short it's because of the structures the morphological structures that are present on the bee uh, tongue that it is called as long or short tongue right a short tongue bee also can be huge in size or it can be very tiny similarly a long tongue bee also can be really tiny or huge we'll look at these long and short tongue bees in the coming slides now right then let's move on to some more structures presence of an, uh, antennal sutures now sutures are like places where there's a joint made uh, and as the insects involved, uh, sorry, evolved through the years, what happened was there were different segments of the body which started fusing together, right? And but nature left its mark. Although the play, uh, the different segments they do not open apart like that uh, as such, but you can see that oh, these may be some segments which were earlier free and now they are fused. So you can see a mark here. You can see there's a single suture. You can see there's a double suture, and usually you can find these uh, on different parts of the body. Here I'm showing you the 
antennal sutures that is sutures below the antenna now depending on these how many sutures are present on the uh, below the antenna again these are divided into different groups so all these characters which we saw till now help us to identify bees into different groups there's one more um, strong identification character here which divides the one particular group of bees from rest of the other bees that's the presence of facial fovea or depressions or depression like fits on the uh, face of the bee you can see here on the picture on the left there's a dip inside next to the eyes right and that particular structure or similar structures are seen in all the bees in the particular family called as, called as andronidae andronidae like i said earlier are spread all across the globe except in australia they are found everywhere except in australia then you can see the picture on the right here you see all that dip like or that depression like uh, structure is missing right so this puts bees easily into different groups families or classes uh, sorry or not classes into different groups of bees then there are many more other structures if you look at the bee thorax from the top if you look at it from the side the presence of suture or joints and different colorations or pits on the body of the bee all of these different structures that you see on a thorax on its side or on on top of it actually helps you distinguish bees again into different groups right then comes the wing venation and number of cells you can see here that this particular wing has like three submarginal cells these tiny cells are called submarginal cells right and then there this particular bee wing has like two submarginal cells so such structures actually help us in identifying bees into different groups again right now once we know all these structures we are like okay there are so many different um, species in the world there are birds there are lizards there are mammals there are um, there are humans there are primates there are so many different groups of organisms who can pollinate accidentally or as a um, mode of their nutrition let's say or maybe some behavior of their life but then why are bees so important for us why not some other group of animals now let me bring your attention to the fact that along with bees there are some other groups of pollinators which solely carry out pollination because it's closely associated with their nutrition and such pollinators are really efficient groups that help in the process natural process of pollination right so what is pollination pollination is the process where pollen grains are moved from the female part of the flowers to the male part of the flowers right and for this uh, the pollen needs to get attached to the bodies of the bees so let us look ahead how bees make something different here, some difference here you see all these pictures here you can see a pollen comb right here you can see a pollen basket here you can see a bee who has hairs on its abdomen on which pollen is stuck if you look at that bee this is how the hairs will look it's not the same species but it's the same group so all these structures of hair actually help in carrying all that pollen on their body and then they move among the same flowers from one flower to another bringing about cross pollination and also a lot of bees are very specific like we know about honey bees but these honey bees are generalist feeders or they feed on large number of flowers um, that are found in nature or in the farms and for them if one of the plants is missing they can forage on another plant but then the large the vast majority maybe there are like more than 18000 species of bees which have floral fidelity floral fidelity means they are specifically pollinating or eating pollen and nectar collecting pollen and nectar for a particular group of plants right then because of that there are certain plants like like for example uh, orchid bees which we'll see in the next uh, slide who specifically po uh, pollinate orchids 
right? Then these are of different sizes we saw in the previous um, part, where you can see that um, these bees of different sizes actually have different foraging ranges. That is, they can move anywhere from a few meters to a few kilometers for foraging pollen and nectar. Then all these different bees have different types of nesting habits. So this nesting habit, we will look ahead in, uh, in a couple of slides now. So all these behaviors make them efficient pollinators. They have special adaptations on their body. They are specific to flowers. Then they have huge uh, foraging ranges from few meters to few kilometers. Then diverse nesting sites. And all of them together help us understand the fact that bees are one of the most important groups. Besides bees, we also have other pollinators like we have bats. There are certain bees, uh, sorry, there are certain birds like the hummingbirds, the sunbirds who pollinate particular groups of plants, right? Now, our next question is, the moment we talk about bees, okay, there is honey, you can see thousands of workers, these are the things that you imagine. But then the very next thing that comes to your mind is the stinging of a bee. I'm sure a couple of you may have been stung by bees, maybe out of curiosity or accident, or maybe some of you are also beekeepers for whom it's a very common affair. So why do bees sting and do they all die after stinging? So let's look at this part. Bees. Uh, honey bees have these stings which have barbs on the end of their sting. If you see the sting here, the brown part, you can see there are barbs on the sting. Now, this sting further is attached to the digestive system of the uh, honey bee. Now, when it stings, when it pierces the skin, the barb gets stuck inside the skin and it cannot be removed. So instead, there's, a, there's an opposite reaction to it the digestive system is pulled out and that's how worker bees actually die when they sting. So you'll be like, why do workers do something like this? Now it's interesting to note that evolution has brought something called as, uh, what do you say, um, altruistic behavior in bees where they will do and die for their kin or their closely related bees. Usually all these workers, they are sisters, right? And they're all daughters to the one single queen, which is there on the hive. Now, the hive is a huge place with lots of resources. So to protect that hive, the bees put their life into danger by stinging us and then dying within a few hours. So this happens in case of the honeybees. But if you look at the non-honeybees, they do not have such barb structures because most of them are solitary living. That is, they live alone, they manage their own nests, and the nests are really tiny. And hence, their sting is smooth. So what they do is they just pierce the skin and they uh, inject the venom and then they remove the sting and they fly off, right? They take off. And in this, all we have is uh, left is some venom in our skin and which is a bit irritating, right? In case of solitary bees, Usually since they stay singly around on the ground or maybe in tree barks and things like that, our attention does not go to them. And because not just us, but other predators like bee, uh, bears and monkeys can easily see huge hives. That's why you have this particular character here in the honeybees, right? So let's just go ahead and look at what these bees eat and what exactly happens with what they eat. Now, bees, the main nutrition that bees have is the pollen and the nectar. Nectar is a rich source of sugar for them, right? It's a rich source of carbohydrate, high in energy. And what they do is they suck this nectar from the flower, go and deposit it in their nest. Then they dry it to a particular moisture content level. And then this is stored for the young ones to be fed. In case, of, uh, so in case of the pollen which is taken, now pollen is a very rich source of protein. So all this pollen which is collected, when they move from flower to flower, they actually distribute a lot of this pollen around in the similar species. At the same time, they collect this stash of protein, take it to their hives, and they prepare bee bread out of it, 
which is fed to the young ones again right now besides the pollen and besides the nectar which is collected these also require a lot of minerals which you will see that these are collecting from moist soil uh, sometimes they are collecting it from rotten fruits sometimes it's also you'll also find them on cow dung fresh cow dung patties you know things like that there are also some records where i've heard that bees are sucking some uh, um, salts from the sweat that comes on our body uh, you remember the picture previously where on the tip of the finger there's a sweat bee the name comes actually from that behavior it comes to collect sweat from the animals right now do bees actually require specific diet because we earlier spoke about something like you know specialized for particular flowers and things like that here is an example of a orchid bee uh, uh, you can see that these this orchid bee has a really long tongue i mean just look at it the bee is around i guess 1 mm or something in size and the tongue is way beyond its body length and it has to literally fold it under its body and here in this picture d you can see that there's a orchid on the left side and this bee is hovering over the orchid with its tongue out maybe it's soon going to suck a lot of nectar and then fly off now it's interesting to note that these orchids and the orchid bees have coevolved so all these bees or all these species which are uh, closely associated with another species maybe a plant or animal they usually have you'll see a history of coevolution and then um, extinction local extinction of any of these uh, one of them can cause the depletion of the other species soon so a lot of these places where we have habitat destruction in small wilderness areas if you have orchids and if you have orchid bees feeding on them if if the habitats of the bees are destroyed orchids are going to go off soon if the habitats of the orchids are destroyed the bees will disappear soon so these are the kinds of reactions which are happening right and it's important that we become a little more conscious about how particular habitats are used by which species and how depleting a particular habitat is going to affect that species right now besides feeding on all this nectar sugar minerals Uh, there's a little bit of funny thing that the bees do you have this uh, this character of the bees called as nectar robbing which as the name suggests it actually goes and starts robbing for nectar and it's not beneficial for plants because the nectar is taken free of cost the pollen is not even touched and usually flowers which are still yet to bloom that is where nectar robbing is done from so you can see here this flower hasn't bloomed well but then the bee has managed to get in and it's sucking on to the nectar the pollen are yet to man, uh, mature completely and it's a, this is a citrus flower citrus fruit flower so these kinds of uh, activities sometimes a lot, couple of bees uh, do and it's interesting to see they also sometimes puncture a hole at the base of the flower just to get the nectar and then finish their work and fly off now we spoke of a lot of different body characters different groups of bees and all we will look at two major groups into which bees can be divided and it's quite beneficial for a variety of group like us which is present today here at the session so let's look at them so we have the social bees which consists of all the honey bees and uh, then the bumble bee and the stingless bee and there are a couple of other groups a uh, group of bees too so look at the uh, let's look at the major honey bees which are found in india in general so we have this rock or the cliff bee called the apis dorsata in certain regions uh, around india like for example in maharashtra we call them agyamo because these bees are really uh, not agyamo agyamo yes so there's one wasp oh that is ganjil mashi so this one is agyamo and these build these huge nests uh, of 1 by 1 meter or so and then you can see that you know they are guarded by thousands of bees on that hive and a single sting from this bee is enough to get fever sometimes because 
really painful. I mean, I have also heard of cases from local areas where I work with farmers that uh, an old woman or a person who was weak as such uh, physiologically got stung by a few of these bees and they are dead. There are no more kinds of things. So yes, these bees are really ferocious. And you can also find, uh, you can find them easily in uh, natural areas. They are hanging from the cliffs or the underside of the rocks. And these rocks or cliffs or the trees or the buildings that they occupy are really tall, right? Because they hate disturbance. Then you have the Apis floria, the dwarf honeybee. Uh, this one has a stomach which is reddish, orangish, yellow. And usually when you see it in nature, the stomach actually, the abdomen, I mean, this part actually looks reddish yellow. And it's one of the easiest characters to identify it. You can find it in huge numbers on tiny flowers like um, fenugreek, etc. Right? And the nests that these bees make are as big as our palm, a medium sized palm. And the nests are made in twigs and bushy shrubs uh, where not much of uh, predation or human disturbance happens. You will find them. Uh, in such farm boundaries and places like that. The easiest place to find them is uh, lantana bushes. Sometimes you can also find them in drumstick trees. So these are the common areas where you can find them. Then you have the Apis sirana indica or Apis sirana sometimes it's called the Asian hive bee. This one is uh, common to India. It's native to the Indian subcontinent and uh, yeah, it, it prepares these um, hives which consist of seven to eight combs. And that's why in regions like Maharashtra, they've also called this Satiri uh, Mashti also sometimes because they make seven of those combs, seven to eight. And yes, these are efficient pollinators since they are native variety. They do not contract too many diseases, exotic diseases either. And at the same time, they also, um, they have these groups of plants which they'll forage from and uh, they have this high uh, tendency of absconding so if you're trying to keep these bees at home you have to make sure that they have some alternative when flowers aren't around otherwise they have this uh, easy tendency of just flying off with the entire colony and then coming back maybe if they come back in the flowering season that's that's how they do here in the himalayas if you look at them uh, the the people the communities here they build special uh, structures in the house walls where there are hollows at specific places and these bees occupy those spaces every year in spring and leave by the beginning of winter or so and it's interesting they have a very close interaction with humans for it's been for hundreds of years now so if you happen to come to the Himalayas you can easily see this besides that you can also find them sometimes in the city in places which are not disturbed in in, uh, cracks inside the wall or hollows inside the wall, hollow trees, trunks, etc. You'll find them also in tiny rock cracks, etc. Then you have the stingless bee, and these are like really tiny bees, and uh, they have they they are stings like stingless bee, as the name suggests. Their stings are actually rudimentary; they do not use it to sting people or sting predators. But their best defense is to actually take all the resin from the plant which they collect in their nest and then they just apply it on the predator and it's really annoying so that's how they protect their nest and themselves from the predators and but then there are some species in australia which can actually sting you and i guess a couple of days ago i heard from someone that there were some stingless bees and they stung here in india too but i need to confirm it without a picture i cannot do that so stingless bees are the only uh, particular group of bees that are not honeybees actually. They're not true honeybees. They come into a completely different genus, a completely different tribe of bees. Uh, the rest of the ones that we saw, the four different varieties on before this we saw, they're all true honeybees and they come under the same group called as the same genera called as Apis, right? So stingless bees have a lot of different uh, genus. You have Tetragonilla, you have Trigona, you have uh, Melipona, right? And here again, stingless bees have a very close interaction with a lot of indigenous tribes around tropical and subtropical regions of the world. Then you come to the bumblebees. Now, bumblebees are also social bees. 
they have a small nest they begin actually as a solitary bee because the queen has to uh, the queen hibernates herself all by herself and once the spring season starts she emerges from her nest and she starts provisioning the nest all by herself with nectar and with pollen and then as the reserves of food increases in amount she starts laying uh, the worker and the male bees and once all that process is done when those male bees develop when the workers develop the worker bees who are females who start, they start foraging for food and she starts remaining inside in the nest and she comes out only to mate with males from other nests at um, particular locations uh, in the environment so that's about the bumblebees and uh, you can find bumblebees only in the cooler regions around the world uh, himalayas have a lot of different species then you can look into more about bumblebees on the natural history museum uh, website i'll share the link at the end of this uh, session right and bumblebees are really nice to cute to look at they they look like the teddy bears among the bees you can see all the color colorful hair present on their body and they are really huge they are as big as the carpenter the giant carpenter bees now we looked at all these different social bees but then the ancestral bees were solitary are solitary the bees are more uh, closely related in their behavior to the wasp like ancestors so let us look at them here is a picture that you can see it's a carpenter bee then if you look at the first group this is a cuckoo bee now the moment you say cuckoo you can understand the cuckoo bird and you can immediately remember how the cuckoo bird is a parasite so these bees are also kleptoparasites you can call them or you can call them parasitic bees what they do is the adults once they emerge from the nest they they forage for themselves they feed themselves with nectar and pollen and all they do is just go and lay eggs in the nests of some bee which is not from their uh, particular group because their group does not make a nest so what they do is they wait outside the nest in hiding till the actual owner of the nest goes out as soon as that particular bee is out of sight the parasitic bees the, these cuckoo bees they enter the nest go and lay the egg and then then they just rush out just in time and but if they are caught they are killed by the uh, nest owners so and when the nest the actual bee from the nest comes and she sees that oh there's already an egg on the uh, on the re food reserves which are kept she just seals it and then she starts foraging again to put the next egg but then a couple of times the unfortunate bee whoever nest whoever's nest is invaded by this cuckoo bee they will have mostly these parasitic Uh, groups but then the poor bee she does not understand so these are the cuckoo bees you can see that uh, their body does not have much of the hairy structures like it's completely reduced you can see some pollens and all stuck here but it's of no use because these bees are not collecting it for the young ones they're just feeding directly from the plant right then you have the minor bees like the name suggests these bees are involved in a lot of mining you can see they are mining structures here they they bored a hole into a, they have mined into the soil which is well drained and usually on a slopey land here you can see the slopey land very clearly and uh, what they do is they just excavate it and they make their nest inside and again they'll make some uh, provisions of food that is nectar and pollen and then lay an egg and then seal it then make another such structure uh, either a nest or just layers of these provisions of food and egg here you can see a bee um, actually mining into the soil here you can see a bee approaching mines uh, it's uh, sorry it's a uh, nest here you can see a bee emerging from the ground from its nest you may have some parasite hiding here we don't know so as the name suggests these are the mining kind of bees they bore holes into the soil then is the mason bees now mason bees actually build these nests um in already present structures but they do a lot of masonry work they'll they'll collect probably soil mix it with their saliva or they'll collect some fibers from the plant and mix it with their saliva or 
uh, some resin from different plants and then they'll start lining inside these cavities which are already present in the vial. Here you can see a bee home or a bee hotel provided to these bees by a um, lot of different people who are enthusiastic about providing homes to such species. So these are of different sizes. The bees will go inside, they will, if they want, they will make the holes a bit bigger. They'll line it with some material like wax from their body or the soil and saliva or plant fibers. And then they'll start laying their eggs inside it. Here you can see, sorry, here you can see a snail shell, which is, this is all probably, yeah, this is all pollen. And you can see a partition here and then it's sealed. So this shell is like transversely cut open to show what the structures exactly inside are and how bees are using all these different empty spaces in nature for uh, making their nest, right? So that's done with mason bees. Let's go to the next group of bees. These are the leaf cutter bees. Now leaf cutter bees, the name is suggesting it so clearly, they cut the leaves into different shapes. Usually it's ellipses. And you can see that they have these very sharp teeth like structures or denticles on their mandibles. And these are used in cutting, you can see here in picture number two, cutting the leaf into an ellipse or a circular uh, piece. And then in the picture number three, you can see that how they're putting this leaf, these leaves inside the cavity. Now, if you look around, if you're a very keen observer in nature, you have a garden or maybe whenever you go outside somewhere, into the wilderness, you'll see such structures, you see pieces, roundish, ovalish pieces missing from the leaves. And in huge numbers, you'll see that it's missing. So this is the work of a leaf cutter bee. You can see here how the bee is holding those uh, cut leaves in their three pairs of legs and just flying to their nest. Hmm? So this is how the behavior of the bee has actually helped it evolve its uh, mandibles or the jaws for cutting the leaves. Next group is the carpenter bees. Again, here the name is suggesting that it does something related to carpentry. You can see here on, in picture number one, this carpenter, this is a giant carpenter bee and it, it's actually cutting the wood. I mean, just look at how it has literally chewed into the wood. Then you can see here some really old nests of um, bees. If you, if you get a chance to visit the rural areas, uh, if you look at the cow sheds which are made traditionally, you can see even inside teak wood they've made like these large holes in which these bees actually uh, lay their eggs, provision the food to the young and they use these nests. Every year you'll see that there are bees occupying these cavities. Then here in picture number three is a tiny carpenter bee. Now, it's interesting to note here, the giant carpenter bees are really big. They're like one and a half centimeter or so plus or minus. And this tiny carpenter bees are actually really small. They are almost, I would say five to six millimeters. Slight differences are there plus minus. And then um, these actually get into the pith of the stems or twigs, sometimes also in reeds or grass which you use to thatch your roof, you can also see them there. Here you have the tiny carpenter bee. Here in picture number five, you have the five, you have giant carpenter bees. Again, you can see the bees, young bees in different stages of development. This one is more mature than this one here. So this is what the carpenter bees do. They, they carpenter their way through the wooden uh, substrates and then they have their nest ready there and they will provision it with uh, food here, you can see very clearly. I guess uh, these are not provisioning actually, these are young bees getting out of a stem which is cut by probably a biologist or someone to look at their nest. So they're like just getting out. This one is yet to mature. It still doesn't seem much active, right? Then these are the different bees, groups of bees that we saw. So if you can try to recollect quickly you see that you have very few honeybees and you have many more other kinds of bees. But somehow our focus has always been honeybees. So one of my our efforts here is to also appreciate all these other different types, kinds of bees. 
which probably form more than 18,000 different species across the globe. In India itself, we have more than 750 different species and every few months or so, new species are added to the list. Since we are a tropical country and also we have these diverse habitats, there ought to be lots and lots, and lots of bees. So I was working in uh, Northeast a couple of months ago and there every time people came up with some uh, particular group, which probably I haven't read the name in the checklist or I have, haven't seen it earlier myself. So that's the huge diversity of bees that we have and we need to maintain the habitat for such bees so they can keep continuously pollinating our different plants. Now let us look at some more characters of bees here. This, these particular behaviors are very specific to male bees. Let us look at them. So when male bees emerge, so they're the first ones to emerge usually among the solitary bees or the bees that live alone, which we just saw in a couple of slides now. So the males emerge first because they have to go and they have to start guarding or um, sort of breaking regions with very good flower resources. That's how they can attract female bees, right? So while they guard these places, here is a male carpenter bee. While they guard these places, they're really aggressive. They are on and off at war with other males from the similar species to you know, protect the floral resources to attract females. But then these, there are some groups of bees in which the males are aggressive with each other throughout the day guarding the territory. But in the evening or during the time when the sun starts setting or it's still early in the morning, you can see these very bees, male bees that are fighting with each other, they clump together just to keep themselves warm. As soon as the sun is out, they're back to their jobs guarding their uh, regions for mating. So it's a very funny behavior that I find. This particular picture here of a male bee on radish plant is from Dune Valley. This picture here is from Andhra. And this is where I was interning for a while. Um, in 2018. Really interesting how they stick together. Even if you touch them with your finger, they are not disturbed. We spoke about all these now different kinds of bees and what the different structures are, but we didn't talk about a uh, short yet about how important they are to us. So we spoke partly about pollination, which is the um, process of shifting pollen from one uh, flower to another. And this helps in cross-pollination and obviously in seed production. And you'll be surprised to know that 85% of this pollination which is done by animals is chiefly by bees. And most of the pollination which is recorded is only of the honeybees or majorly of the honeybees because the rest of the bees are really cryptic and uh, not many researchers actually look into what exactly they are foraging. I mean, Recently, in the past, uh, past few decades, people have also started to look at these groups of bees which were ignored because honeybees are uh, seriously dwindling in numbers due to colony collapse disorders and things like that. Then it's amazing how much economic input these pollinators do without paying anything for them. I mean, they just come, they, it, it's their service into nature, which probably they are also not aware of. We just come foraging for nectar and pollen, but then look at the huge amount of um, contribution that they give us. And imagine if these particular species vanish locally or globally, the kind of um, uh, constraints that we will have in the food that is available. So one third of the food that we eat that comes on a plate on the table actually is a contribution of pollinators chiefly being from bees. And all these different ecosystem services sustain not just humans, but the domesticated animals and the huge variety of uh, wild animals out there directly and indirectly, right? They also improve, improve the genetic variety that is the natural hybridization process in the plants. They improve the fruit sets, the seed sets, the number of fruits or seeds, the quality, the juiciness of the fruit, etc. So that's how bees contribute. Besides, they also are part of a huge uh, group of indigenous uh, tribes across the world who solely depend on beekeep, uh, bee 
honey extraction from the wild. Here you can see that this particular uh, indigenous individual from some indigenous group in Southeast Asia is actually uh, smoking that hive so that he can collect the honey. You can see all the bees are collected at one corner of the hive. Right? Now, all the factors that are affecting humans as well as other species are also affecting the bees. Uh, be it habitat fragmentation or habitat destruction or be it um, use of chemicals on farms and also um, infections and diseases that come to the honeybees that are kept uh, on farms at various places um, are actually the different reasons that cause dwindling in the number of honeybees. And this has been studied for years now and over the past 50 years, this, the rate of this uh, decline of bees has been really high. And hence in 1999 at the Sao Paulo um, conference, what they did was uh, they actually came up with this declaration where we have to uh, conserve our bees sustainably so that they sustain for years to come as well as uh, their services are given to humans and the wilderness alike. So it's called the Sao Paulo Declaration. If you Google it, you can read the whole declaration and how things and programs are done all around the world. In India, uh, under, under that particular declaration, there were different programs across the world. There was one uh, called the Global Pollinator Project. Uh, in India, we had three sites. But besides that also, there are efforts being done to conserve bees, their habitats, and also having a lot of garden-like um, um, not garden, wilderness structures around the cities, etc., are actually conserved to have these habitats to for the bees to be found, for these wild bees to be found in the local areas. So what can we do exactly to conserve bees? Like we as, let's say, non-biologists or uh, people from non-scientific background, or we as citizens in general, citizens of the earth, what can we do? The best we can do is try and spread as much awareness as possible. So we have had a couple of programs. I mean, I've been working on these since 2012, and I've, I've worked closely with farmers, with different communities, with students on spreading awareness about these, like the program we have here today. Then besides that, growing a lot of mixture of crops and also maintaining all these wilderness around farmlands, also maintaining wilderness in urban areas, is really important to attract a lot of these uh, honeybees as well as non-honeybees. Uh, and besides these, we should not use chemicals as indiscriminately being used. I mean, we should actually use organic formulations which are easily available in stores or we can also produce our own. You can also contact me if you want to know some of the solutions, like organic solutions to pest control. Or we can also maintain these habitats along with the bees, bee habitats, to attract of a lot of these predatory insects who just go and catch all these pollinators and things, and um, who go and catch all these pests besides pollinators, and uh, they help in maintaining the integrity, the biological integrity or the ecological integrity in nature. And you don't have to actually invest into those costly chemicals and then get poisoned yourself. So you have predatory insects, you have predatory birds, you should encourage those on your farm, right? Then having activities like this, setting up homes for bees. This one we did in Darjeeling and we had huge response. A lot of locals joined us, a lot of students from different universities joined us and we were able to produce these um, cost-effective homes with no inputs actually from any waste which is available around. So with this, we come to the end of the session today. And just a thought before we leave that every species on earth has to be respected. They all have their roles. It does not matter they're big or they're small, but they all have their specific roles. And the moment we lose out on a particular species or a particular group of species locally or globally, we are calling a lot of trouble for ourselves. And here it's on a funny note here, when one of the insects, the, the dung beetle is telling the other one, imagine the world would be 
drowned in shit if we wouldn't do our work on time. So it's really, f- it's funny at the same time, it's something that makes us think a lot. So if you're interested to know more about these, there are a couple of these um, websites that you can check. I will share all of this information with the organizers so that they can share it in turn with you on the groups, right? So you have uh, the Rufford, uh, Rufford projects. You can see my page for free um, pamphlets and information. You can take the reports, you can download, you can spread it with, I mean, among groups and people and everyone. Then there's something called as the discoverlight.org on which you'll find the list of species of bees around the world with pictures of most of them. Then you have the bee wars. Here you can look at the different groups of bees and more um, information is found on different groups. And again, how many different species or what are the different kinds you find in different areas. Then you have the Natural History Museum website where you can find a huge information on bumblebees and the color patterns for identifying bees across the world. You can actually take pictures of bees, you can send me, or you can actually check out here on the Natural History Museum for bumblebees. Rest of the bees you can share with me if you wish on my uh, Gmail ID, which is here. Besides, if you want to volunteer or track or discuss bees, uh, you can feel free to write me and we will probably put up a chat session together or something like that. And uh, yeah, we can track these in your region, even remotely at this moment, right? So with this, I end uh, the session here. And I would like to thank Greenworks Trust first foremost, because they've been really generous in letting me give all this time. And I hope I'm not over the specified time yet. Hope so. And uh, please uh, take a moment to look at their work. And I would urge all of you, if you are able to kindly donate to Greenworks Trust, uh, because they're doing amazing work of getting uh, information and awareness about the environment to the huge number of people who who do not have time to actually look at these things. They are interested, but then their life is so busy that these people are trying, the Greenworks Trust is trying to get science across or get information across and to make people sensitive. Then there are these other organizations whom I've worked with, whom I've studied with, and who've supported me a lot. And thank you so much for uh, being here. And I think uh, the team can take over and we can take over the questions. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Preeti Madam, for this lovely session. Uh, now I request a participant, if they have any doubt, uh, please write them in the chat box. We have option of chat box. There are already a few of questions there. Uh, Preeti Madam, can I read it for you or uh, you are checking it? Uh, I am checking it. But, but there are a few questions. It would be questions. nice if you can read so I can yeah, answer yeah, one will, by one. Yeah, I will read it for uh, you. No problem. So we'll take the first question. Uh, what are some mm-hmm. of the issues we facing? Yes. Because of uh, the is being farmed extensively uh, on... Hello, there is a disturbance. I request uh, everyone to please mute the mic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I done that. Sorry. So I'll take the question again. Uh, what are some of the issues we facing or will face because of Epis mellifera is being farmed extensively in our commercial bee farming? Hmm. So yes, I am one of those persons who actually usually advocate for, always advocate for the native species. Now the trouble is not with Apis mellifera as such, if you see when it comes to its native range, right? But then in other ranges where it's introduced, there's a huge competition with the native bees, not just native honeybees, but also native, other groups of non honeybees. And there's competition over food, there's competition probably over space. So we have to be sensitive about it. Besides, Apis mellifera, since it's from a particular region, it is susceptible to certain kinds of diseases. And uh, it will not fare really well in your local region. So try and find out if you have some native species of honeybees in your area. So the major issue will be with uh, disease, spreading of these diseases. There's one thing called as the Varroa mite infestation. There are those mites you could, you saw in my slide also that uh, those mites were stuck to the young bee bodies. They draw all the nutrition 
and the b develops uh, not very strong body uh, structures or they are deformed and it's difficult for them to navigate back to their nest and it's one of the major reasons of colony collapse disorder across the world so i would always advise that people go for native bees so in india we have the asian hive bee or the apis sirana indica it's a small box easily one can handle even a small child like maybe 10 to 15 um, from 10 years to you know further up a very old person also can easily handle it and uh, their stinging is not that painful as compared to the melisera and yes they are uh, they have their own mechanism of being resistant to the local diseases right next question i hope i answered the question so we can go to the next question yes 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 so is there information on these yeah. non generalist bees which are dwindling uh, because of, uh, because diversity is lost what what can be planted for these special bees mm -mm. that's such a nice question and it's nice to see that a, a diverse group asks such a question so all these non generalist bees also called as the solitary bees or sometimes uh, different groups are there these bees can be attracted by encouraging a lot of wild flowering plants around their area if you look at the local library if they have a flora of the local area uh, you can easily find the different types of plants found that in that area naturally you can let those plants grow and uh, you can also reduce a lot of this lawn uh, management that you do at home try instead to have more of those native plants that grow which we actually eradicate calling them weeds the weedy sides also in farms as well as gardens so these kinds of plants uh, maybe the daisy type or maybe um, some tubular types of flowers different shapes of flowers will attract different pollinators so that should be in mind different colors different shapes and they have to be native the moment you put something exotic it's it's just for show usually and it just makes a look garden look wow but it doesn't offer much um, to the lo local pollinators that you have so it's nice to encourage these wild flowers and believe me wild flowers look much more beautiful than the exotic varieties that we put into the uh, into our gardens right you can you can get in touch with me on gmail i'll give you a list of local plants from areas that i've walked in okay uh then one question uh, hmm. what is the function of facial fovea uh so there is no direct function of a facial fovea it's uh, one of the identifications uh, into a different group of bees there's no special function so some of the functions have just become rudimentary maybe there were a lot of punctures around uh, which fused together as the bees evolved to become a depression right but for taxonomists for biologists from a taxonomic point of view from classification of the systematic point of view it's an important character on the bee okay uh, then uh, mm -hmm. why does australia have so much importance in the grouping or distribution of bees uh, a and then is bhramar or bhunga what we call in marathi is a bumble bee uh, if yes as you said they are found mm -hmm. in colder climates how are they found in maharashtra okay 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 right so the first question was about uh too many questions can you tell me the first I'll question repeat, again i'll repeat why does australia have yeah, so much australia, importance yeah australia australia yes yeah yeah so in case of actually it's not that australia has a lot of importance we are trying to look at the world and how bees are distributed so there is one particular group um that the family called stenotretidae which is found only in australia it's not found anywhere in the world then there is uh, the other groups of bees uh, which are found all over the world so if i go back to the slide let me just go on myself not very clear with all the families yes so uh continent wise or biogeographically certain groups of bees are found in certain areas right so you have 
the green one here, stenotritidae, found only in Australia. Then you have the yellow ones, colitidae, halictidae, megachilidae, and apidae. These are found, uh, these are widespread, including in Australia. They're everywhere. It's not that, it's just that all those groups of bees which are now found in Australia are highlighted here, right? There's nothing specific about Australia otherwise. Then uh, the red one, melitidae, it's found all over the world except in South America and Australia, right? Now, your next question related to um, uh, Bhonga. Bhonga, so Bhonga yeah. or uh, the one that we see, it's a Bhonga. So that is uh, the carpenter bee, right? So carpenter bees are find, found in a lot of these warm, hot, humid areas around the globe. And uh, bumblebees are the more hairier ones. They're more colorful. Even carpenter bees are, but carpenter bees have more metallic sheen on them. Uh, they are less fuzzy. And those are the ones that you find widely across India. Bumblebees are found only in the colder regions. In case of India, it's in the Himalayas. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then how does nectar differ from yes. honey? How does mm -hmm. the conversion takes place? So what happens is that the bees, they collect the nectar. It has a lot of different um, sugars or sugar compounds. Uh, and it's high in water content. So what the bees do, they take this nectar and then they put it in their um, nest and then they uh, dehydrate it like by fanning. In case of honeybees, it's a really well-studied process where the forager bees or the bees that go and get the food, they put the nectar into the cells and the water is dried with fanning of the wings continuously. Uh, and then an optimum amount of moisture is left, which uh, avoids any fungal growth or any bacterium or any pathogens to grow in that honey. That's how honey is prepared. Okay. Uh, then what is the status of bees in India and what are the major research gaps mm -hmm. here? So the major research, uh, the major issues with bees in India are first thing, the kind of farming that move, we are moving into. So since the, uh, in this, uh, the green revolution happened, we've actually left a lot of our traditional knowledge on farming and using uh, traditional methods of uh, pest control or weed control or things like that in the farms. We've adopted more mechanized, more chemical based farming, which is a real bad sign. Uh, but then fortunately, a lot of people are becoming aware now and they're trying to get back to uh, traditional farming methods. But then it's still a very slow process. And uh, besides that, yes, we are going with a huge rush towards development, which is cutting down a lot of these native uh, wilderness areas and habitats for bees and other pollinators and many different species actually not just pollinators so that's the next major thing um changes in the climate yes the, the moment that weather changes the flowering patterns change and this has been observed very uh, well in colder regions around the world in india not many studies yet done but around the world they found in these cooler regions that Bumblebees, when they emerge, the flowers have already emerged and dried out or the flowers emerge late and the bumblebees emerge early. There's a mismatch. So that's one of the reasons and probably we'll see certain patterns in India, but then there's a huge research gap here. Besides that, yes, uh, since this is a group of insects, the kind of funds which are allotted for research uh, uh, work or the policies which are made usually focus on a lot of charismatic species and that's where we need to put a lot of focus on again our agricultural universities or agricultural departments they they do more research on honeybees than they do on these non honeybees and it's a sad sight that we we actually overlook uh, non honeybees completely and yes the biggest biggest threat ever to any region around the globe would be the lack of taxonomy in India itself, we do not have very authentic groups of taxonomists that deal with bees. We do have certain people and they're doing amazing work, but then bees is such a huge group. Imagine 19,000 plus species that people focus on a particular group, not even a family. They go deep into tribe level and sometimes uh, even final levels. So it's difficult to have, and all of these people are scattered 
you know, we need to bring them together. And that's one of my efforts where we can actually get get taxonomies together. My myself, uh, myself, I'm not well versed in taxonomy. I can only look at the families and maybe major groups. But when it comes to taxonomic work, a lot of my species from the PhD work is still here in the insect box, not identified. So we need to have authentic taxonomies too. So all these are the different in, in impediments in research as well as uh, other reasons for decline in bees. The status of bees, we have some 750 plus species. The numbers keep increasing every time, as I said earlier. So you can look at the discoverlife.org uh, where under the label IN, you will see all the different species that are found in India. But then most of these records are really old. They are probably 50 years plus old records. So we need to have more latest research. Yeah. Okay, I'll take the next question. Before that, I request you one thing. Many people are asking uh, to, uh, you to go to the slide where you have mentioned your email ID so that they can just put it, uh, take it down. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I am going there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can ask me the next question. Yeah. Uh, one participant has asked, uh, I once saw some hundreds of bees dead just near the beehive. Uh, that was near agriculture field uh, where they uh, quite mm -hmm. often spray chemicals. Do bees uh, die naturally or could, mm -hmm. could it be linked with the chemical used in the field? Uh, chemical use can be actually directly related uh, to such huge numbers. If you see, they are found under the hive or say, you know, if you see it around the farm, the first main reason, uh, reason is chemicals. The second um, cause could be, but not always, that those huge numbers could also be males, but then they are not uh, thrown out of the nest all year around. It happens only when the resources become less. It's around early winter or the beginning of winter when the hive tries and gets rid of all those dependent bees, usually the male bees, and you see huge numbers fallen now. But then other than this, if you're seeing these bees in huge numbers, it's 100% the chemicals which are being used. Okay, uh, then uh, uh, one mm. question. I have heard that antibiotics are being used in hives. This is for many reasons. I feel it is wrong. What can be done to prevent the sickness caused mm. due to antibiotics with respect to hive hygiene? I hear that if bees have access to fungus in the mycorrhizae, uh, do they get natural protection because of it? Um, well, I can, uh, I can answer the first part of it. I haven't read much about the fungus part which you asked. So, uh, yes, a lot of beekeepers use these antibiotics and all with respect to the uh, hive hygiene. But then, if you actually maintain the specified, um, what do you say, amount of space between the hives or the frames which are inside, or also, you check them regularly and then see to it if there is any water or any other sort uh, source of moisture that is there. If you can check that, you can also you should also have a rich diet of different floral nectars available around, so that you know bees are feeding on all these nutrients and these minerals and proteins and uh, carbohydrates, which keep them strong enough. Like a lot of protection will happen internally because of their healthy physiologies but at the same time there are other things that people use they also rub tobacco or sometimes fumigate with tobacco smoke and things like that uh, but yes usually uh, and also having native native species makes a huge difference uh, a lot of native species uh, can recuperate from any um, disease which happens um, from change in their diet or from time to time with season and all uh, what was the last question? Can I hear it again? Because I can search it up and if you can give me the detail of the participant, I can email it to them. Yeah, I'll read again. <clears throat> I hear that if bees have access to the fungus... High fee. Yeah, the last question. Yeah, so bee, if the bees have huh. access to fungus, mycorrhizae, do they get natural protection because of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll check this out and I'll get back to you. Okay. Right? Okay, so I'll take the uh, next question. 
Sporopollenin yeah. is major constituent of yeah. pollen and is hard to break by enzymes. How do bees digest such complex organic material to gain protein? Mm-hmm. So I'm sure they have evolved certain enzymes in their digestive systems which can actually break down these uh, proteins. But uh, I haven't worked on bee physiology as such yet. So I cannot actually give a very good answer to it. But I'm sure that they have evolved certain enzymes that can break these proteins. Okay. Then... I will, I'll get back to this answer also. I'll search it myself. Okay. Uh, how can I contribute to protect B staying in Mumbai? Right. That's really kind of you to ask that question. It's a nice question. What you can do is uh, if you're living in a system where you have apartments, difficult to maintain plants, you can always have a variety of uh, native plants grown in pots. Or if you have a kitchen garden, try and grow the native vegetables and all found, you know, at least in 100 meter radius in your area. And uh, or um, another thing that you can do if you live in these apartments, if you guys have these colonies, you can come together and as a community garden, if you have a space, a green space in your society or things like that, you can always encourage wildflower patches besides those lawns which are mourned and maintained and managed every year. So that's one way. Uh, another thing you can do is provide water to bees in the summer season and how you can do that is you take a shallow dish like a saucer you put lots of twigs or grass in it and fill it with some water don't submerge the grass right the grass is for the bees to come and land on and they can suck onto that water if you like you can always mix some jaggery or you can mix some salts in it so that the bees can actually suck it up and you know use it for their physiology those are some of the ways. Besides that, yes, you can go on to my uh, referred uh, page. There are a lot of awareness material there. You can take those and you can use them as a uh, awareness generation material in your local group or among your friends and all. And I'll also try to put up uh, two videos on Google Drive. So all of you can use it to show to people. That's a more effective way, I guess, to show about pollinators so yeah these are the ways you can do and these can be used in different areas not just urban areas you can also use them in semi-urban or suburbs or in villages also okay and uh, what is royal jelly so royal jelly is a particular type of protein which is secreted by these workers and it is fed to the um it's a sulfur uh, high in sulfur based compound actually and it is fed to these young ones so usually for the first few days it's fed to everyone including the uh, young queen or the young to be queen and later after two to three days i think after the cycle of three days it is fed only to the queen uh, the supposed to be queen bee throughout her life but the other workers after that they are not fed right it's a high in sulfur compound produced by the workers okay uh, why the sting is barbed in honeybees hmm. does it has to warn its mates when it dies from the sting and uh, stomach coming out uh, well in case of uh, honeybees the barbs actually help so that you know the venom goes into that predator i guess i mean that's what i feel that the entire venom the because the more you try and touch that sting which is there on your skin the more it starts getting uh, uh, irritating so it sort of teaches the predator a lesson or keeps it away from next time approaching a hive and also i've um, noticed that yes when a when a few bees sting you there are more that comes to come to sting you and probably this somehow signifies that like give them some uh, chemical cues uh, which the other um, workers pick up and then they start attacking the predator. So I think it has both the functions. And yes, the abdomen tears off because it's sort of attached to this sting process. And that's how it comes out. 
and the bab and that and then you have these thousands of workers trying to protect the hive so i guess it somehow uh, attracts those other bees on the hive like oh there is a predator so come and start stinging them and that's why that sting remains on the skin that's what i think but then i'll have to read this really well again because uh, i can probably give a more specific answer in that case this is out of my intuition that i am telling okay uh, what is the present next, next question yeah. hmm. uh, what is the present status of genetic research on bees hmm. uh well i do not know much because i do not work in that area of genetics or i don't work on molecular biology mostly but then huge amount of work is done on um, all these honey bees also on um, there is this new trend which has come up in a couple of decades now i mean couple of years now on barcoding species but without proper taxonomic morphological based taxonomic information barcoding bee species doesn't make any sense because first you need to know what species it is otherwise you will be left only with those molecular um codes which do not help much so yeah as far as barcoding is concerned that's what i know but i haven't dealt with molecular work directly if anyone is interested they should go ahead and get in touch with all these labs which work at molecular level maybe we'll get more insights okay uh then are there any feeding adaptation mm -hmm. species with respect to destruction of natural feeding sources by human act feeding adaptations in bees so bees have actually evolved to have these adaptations to forage plum flowers um like they have these tufts of hair around different parts of their body which help in collecting or in combing the pollen together and things like that um uh, besides but then something like these adaptations to foraging hasn't been studied very clearly but yes you can see actually a lot of bees change their nest sites from time to time like there's one example from my field wherein we had this apis dorsata or the rock bee that we know commonly they had made these uh, hives under huge trees in one of the parks Uh, in dun valley there's a place called lachiwala and there are two three trees which had huge number of i think at least 50 to 60 such hives used to be there when i began my study by the time i entered the second and the third year of my phd there were only four or five hives were left and during this period of 3 to 4 years um the highway that used to pass through that park actually developed from a, a double lane to a four lane highway with a flyover with noisy big vehicles and a lot of people also visiting and a lot of disturbance and smoke and particulate matter so i guess those bees either just shifted to some other interior place inside the forest or the park and that's one of the adaptations that they have uh, but otherwise when it comes to temporal or time based adaptations it's difficult because bees use the um, day time the sun to understand their forage and to understand where their nest is so all these things you they cannot change like let's say that if in the day time farmers are spraying chemicals that the bees are foraging at night that doesn't happen foraging at night happens only a couple of species or a couple of groups like some of the carpenter bees and all uh it's difficult for them to actually have some adaptations of that sort because they use light as the main source to go and forage okay and uh, then someone has asked yes. ma'am i have hmm. observed uh, some 20 or 30 honey bees attracted to light bulb and were found on the bulb hanging around what is this behavior of the bees called are they once thrown out of the hive uh see they are not thrown out of the hive usually um it's mostly because they are attracted to light right so you have a bulb burning there and then those bees are attracted to it because it's sort of a light pollution that's not the time that the sun is actually there but then somehow i guess they perceive that oh that's the sun and that's what they're attracted to they're not flying towards the sun but the sun is somehow showing them the forage 
but then at night it's difficult anyways considering their kind of vision it's difficult to trace flowers and flowers mostly do not bloom unless they are night blooming flowers they do not bloom at that time so i guess they just get attracted to the light and they are there and they are ought to die if they remain there long time because the, all that heat is going to dehydrate them okay next uh, then uh, why do uh, people prefer to keep european bees over indian ones so uh, the major reason is the amount of honey which uh, the european bees um, like the western honey bee had rather say the apis mellifera so they give a huge amount of honey i mean you can actually add on to the number of boxes on the hive and then you know extract huge amounts of honey that can get a lot of revenue but and uh, it's these bees remain for longer in the hive as long as you maintain the um, any type of disturbance from occurring or you and also you maintain the hygiene and things like that you provide enough for food alternatively and all but in case of the uh, uh, native indian honey bees which are there what happens is they have a sort of absconding behavior and the honey produced is less uh, you can also see comparatively the apis mellifera boxes are really big compared to the apis cirana or the indian hive bees and uh, obviously you can't add too many boxes called as the super chambers you can't add too many they anyways have a capacity of only seven combs and imagine if you start adding they are not going to use those spaces we you can try but unless there is uh, enough resources and they also need work power right so they don't have those many worker bees it's a smaller hive or a smaller colony compared to mellifera mellifera can go for thousands of bees throughout each of those chambers and they can store a lot of food so that difference is there and that's why mellifera keeping the european or the western or the italian bees all those different things that they use for mellifera um keeping those is more preferred by farmers as compared to the epicirana or the indian hive bees or the native honey bees um and uh, usually uh, people in the like the ethnic communities around the globe are very good at dealing with native varieties uh it is these uh, huge beekeeping um, i would say companies or huge beekeeping firms which prefer mellifera because it uh, it adds on to a huge uh, economic input but then it also occurs uh, like have chances of giving a lot of uh, destruction uh, like destruction or loss through destruction of the hives if hygiene isn't maintained if there are too many aberrations while tra um, transporting these boxes around also they have a lot of diseases which spread quickly unlike the native varieties who can recuperate slowly if the diseases are native next uh, yeah how is the local or indigenous bee population in northeast in india uh, is it declining in northeast india there is no specific study that i have come across yet but uh, from the kind of development that we are doing not just in northeast in india but in other places also um number of trees the moment number of trees reduces or um, rocky precipices and things like that are excavated for mining and activities as such number of honey bees are going to go down and uh, i worked in northeast for a year and a half now and what i have observed is some places huge uh, developmental projects coming out even the recent things um the coal mines and things which are they are coming up with this is going to disturb the honey bees as well as non honey bees on a huge uh, scale at these areas besides other species also which are going to be affected so in future i guess if these projects aren't stopped somehow or their impacts reduced we are going to see huge losses as such i haven't read of uh, studies yet but then traditionally people are keeping these honey bees and all so no record of loss as such but if you go and speak to the local people they will tell you oh all these years we had so many and now we have less so but i didn't get to interact much on bees in the northeast yet and what i've read from 
uh, a decline has not yet been uh, recorded. Actually, it's not recorded anywhere in India very clearly. All um, speculative studies, I mean, references. Okay. Uh, how does a uh, bee develop a specific yeah. affinity towards a particular plant species? So uh, these bees or their ancestral groups have actually co-evolved. So maybe uh, when the um, when the flower evolved, probably it gave some sort of some composition of a nectar, and then the bee co-evolved with um, requirement like. No compulsory requirement of that particular nectar composition, and that's how they go about these characters. So flowers sometimes have patches which look like males of those particular bees. Then there are some other flowers, um, the other bees, which actually, you know, um, they have certain growth requirements which are surfaced only by particular compounds found in the nectar or in the pollen. Usually the pollen. So. This is how they co-evolve with each other, and that's how certain bees uh, forage on specific species or specific groups of plants. And uh, yeah, so vice versa, the flowers also require specific groups of bees to handle them, because the the also the reproductive uh, the reproduction or the emergence of particular pollinators in a particular season affects this, or the emergence of the flowers affect what kinds of pollinators will pollinate it. So it's similar in bees and a lot of different pollinators. <clears throat> okay, uh, we have a lot more questions, uh, but we have some time limit. So we'll take last two questions and then uh, we will uh, shut down the session. Others can mail to uh, Dr. Preeti and she'll be more than happy to reply you. Am, am I right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Any time, as soon as I have network, as soon as I see your email, I'll be answering. Yeah, Please so go we'll ahead. With Take the last the two last questions. questions. Yeah, uh, how the development of male honeybee by mm -hmm. parthenogenesis takes place, and which are the external and internal uh, features influencing it for development? Well, I haven't looked into um, male bee development, so I cannot answer this question. But if I know who is asking, can kindly email me. I will give you very specific answers to it. Right. Okay, and then uh, last question: uh, Can we uh, can we please have a list of plants? I guess the plants which attracts the honeybees. Yes, I will uh, email it to the team, and the team can just forward it to everyone. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Preeti, for the sharing this valuable information about the bees. On World Bee Day, uh, I thank uh, you on behalf of Greenworks Trust for this lovely session. Uh, I hope everyone must have enjoyed this session as well. Uh, we wish to bring more such informative sessions for you with various topics. Uh, so I request everyone to make donation to our organization to support our uh, nature uh, education and awareness initiative. No amount is small for us, so kindly help us. Once again, thank you very much for joining this session. Have a good day all. And happy World Bee Day to all. Yeah, I wish everyone a happy World Bee Day. Bye bye.